I would like to run a bit of a competition. I'd like to see who here has the most impressive scar to enter this competition. You do not have to show the scar, especially if you have to remove clothing to do so. My submission into the most impressive scar involves, um, I, I have a knife, you may have noticed this, and uh, I was handed a, a piece of Italian nugget once by my mother-in-law, and she asked me to cut it up for them. And so I took uh, my knife to start cutting it up, and, and I have spent hours and hours and hours of my life cutting vegetables, dicing, whatever. I, I, at a restaurant, I, I opened every day of the week, just I chopped for an hour for all the vegetables for the day. So I just chopping up one more thing. And I grab the nugget and I get my knife into it, and there's nuts in this nugget, which is unfortunate anyways, because I'd rather not have nuts in it. But my knife hits the nut, and it twists right into the meaty part of right there. And I looked down, and my first thought was, I have filleted myself like a piece of chicken. My second thought was, after a, a spurt of blood, a little small spurt went two foot away, I looked down and thought, I have found an artery. I hope I have not found a ligament, too. And so I clenched down my, I saw if I could still move my thumb, and I clenched it down, and uh, thankfully I could. And so I, uh, I ended up in the hospital and, and had three little stitches and the lady got to hold my hand while I had stitches. And so I have a, a, a reminder now, always use a cutting board, always use a cutting board. So that, that's, my, uh, my, that's my submission to the most impressive scar, but honestly it's not all that impressive. Anyone here got something more impressive? Serious? Yeah. Excellent! An arm through a wall. Yes, that's impressive. Good job. I. I think your wife wins on length and proximity to something fatal. I, I think anyone can beat le long scar down the, the spine. Anyone? Okay, well, you can tell Chandra she has won the impressive scar. Uh, right? It's, it's a great... Uh, whew. Today and for the following two Sundays, we're going to be looking at suffering and the scars they, they cause. Today we look at the, the suffering and scars caused from when we choose poorly. The next weeks we'll look at was scar and star, scar tissue as transition cost and suffering for another. But today it's just the simple things like when you forget to use a cutting board and you find yourself breaking out in that, you know that cold sweat you get? Ugh, right? Today is the scars and scar tissue of our own stupidity. Now, often when we're about to do something that is less than wise, we don't realize it's about to happen, right? No one gets, anyone get up in the morning and say, I'd like to end up in the ER by tonight, right? That's not usually in your agenda. Right? We, we have this amazing superpower, the ability to look at something and say, I can do that. That's not too tall. I can lift that. I don't need to get help. I got this. Anyone else have this superpower? I think we all do. The ability to rationalize, to look at something and think, yeah, I can do this. And, and we seem to be born with this superpower because I have watched my children. Mom said no cookies before breakfast yesterday. But that was yesterday. And this is today. And she's not downstairs yet. And maybe I can get to the cookies in the pantry before she... It, rationalization, right? We all, we all have this ability. It's not just something we're born with. It's something that goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Adam and Eve are, are sitting there, and it is very clear. Eve is with her husband. Adam doesn't get to wiggle out of this one. And, and they're offered a piece of fruit. And the snake says, eat it. It'll be great. And Eve says, no, I really shouldn't. Oh, come on. You're right. God said we shouldn't have cookies before breakfast yesterday. But that was yesterday. And this is today. 
And so they, they had a small snack, right? And, and that, that's a, sometimes our rationalizing that, yeah, I can cut this nugget. I don't need a cutting board. Sometimes it, it, we end up with a scar, which is a reminder, always use a cutting board. And sometimes we can rationalize our way into truly momentously stupid events, things that actually are a real problem. Because rationalization can turn into self-delusion, can turn into a way to lie to ourselves. Have you ever noticed that the first casualty of sin is truth? Right? Think of any sin. You steal something. What's the next thing you have to say? Oh, no, that's mine. Uh, that's, no, no, I, I, I've had that all along. Or, or the, the sin of adultery. You know, my wife or my husband really just hasn't been paying attention to me. I deserve this. I need someone. I, I deserve it's fair that someone should pay attention to me. If you can think of any sin with it, the, right next to it is a lie. Right next to it is a self-delusional, rationalizational moment of, oh, yes, I, I deserve this. Right. I want to look at the story of David to sort of explore how this goes. Because David is an amazing example of this. We, we started out with David a few weeks ago. We were with David when he has his 20 seconds of insane courage, when he charges Bathsheba, or charges Goliath, sorry, jumping ahead. <laughs> charges uh, Goliath, and from then, he has grown to be a great leader. He has been run out of the country by Saul. He has come back after Saul's death. He has become king of the southern tribes. He has un united the northern tribes and the southern tribes. He has created Jerusalem as his, uh, as his capital. He has secured the borders of Israel, and he has just, he's been busy, right? He has been doing a lot. And we come to this point in 2 Samuel, <laughs> where we read that it is the time when the army goes out during the campaign season. It's the time when the army goes out to defend the borders. It's kind of like mending fences if you're a rancher. You just got to go out and make sure everything's where it should be. And so David should be out with his army. But you know, Job can command the armies. And I've been doing a lot. I deserve some time off, don't I? Right? That I deserve. Right? I've been eating good all week. I deserve some cake today, don't I? Right? That rationalization, we are good at it. And David does it too. I deserve some downtime. They, they can just go take care of it. And I'll just chill at the palace. And so he's lounging on the top of the palace while his army is off doing the work. And he sees an attractive woman. And he sends for her because he's king. And he's in charge of everything. And he deserves it, right? Because he it, it's his. He's in charge of everything. He deserves it. She's good looking. Come on, bring her over here. And uh, he takes her. And that verb, take, there are hints of rape there. And that is what it is. And then Bathsheba is pregnant. And so David, you remember how the, every sin then leads to a lie immediately, right? David calls the husband home. And, and, and gets the husband drunk and says, go chill with your wife. You've been a really good soldier. Just go chill with your wife. Have a good night with your wife so that he can tell the lie. It's, it's Uriah's boy. It's not mine. And it um, doesn't work because Uriah tells the, the king, King David, I'm not going to go and have a good time while the army is in the field, which is what David has been doing all summer. So... Uh, at this point, David sends Uriah, Bathsheba's, Bathsheba's husband, back and arranges for the husband to be in the worst of the fighting. And don't you know, he just ends up getting killed in the fighting. And so then David marries Bathsheba. We read on, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said, there were two men in a certain city, one rich, one poor. The rich man had great flocks. The poor man had nothing but one lamb, which he had bought, brought it up, he grew up with him and his children, he used to eat of their meager fare, drank from their cup, and it slept with them at night. This was their, their favorite lamb, their only lamb. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against this man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. 
Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king of Israel, I rescued you from the hand of Saul, I gave you your master's house, gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that hadn't been enough, I would have added more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord and done what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with his sword, taken his wife to be his wife. Now therefore the sword shall not depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin, and you shall not die. Now what does it take for David to see what he has done? Like he's been deluding himself and rationalizing, I deserve to have a good time, right? What does it take for him to actually see what's happening? It takes Nathan. Nathan has been with David for a while now, and he will be with David till the end. Nathan is one of the people that David entrusts with the succession when he wants to make sure his son Solomon is the next king. He turns to Nathan and says, Nathan, make sure Solomon is king. And so the person who can speak to David, the person that David trusts and knows and will listen to, is the one who has been with him all along. And Nathan turns to him and tells Tells him what's going on. Now there are people in our lives that we trust and have walked with us, people who we know will be with us no matter what. They are the people who can help us see when we cannot see clearly. The thing is, we might have to let them know that we're open to it. Right? Because remember, Nathan is the court prophet. He has a position that allows him to speak to the king. The king has looked at him and said, Your job, Nathan, is to tell me what I need to know. And we need to tell our, our folk, we need to tell our Nathans that they can tell us. Right? This week, I had someone come by and tell me something I needed to know, that I'd messed up. And I'm glad they did. But what did I have to do first? I had to make sure they knew that I'm open if they came and told me that I'm going to listen, right? Pe people don't, I'm glad the feedback is offered. We need to make sure that we're inviting it or people, we're Midwesterners, we're not going to be rude, are we, right? We have to be clear that we are open to being told these things. I would not have been told if I had not explicitly said that I want to hear. And we only do that to people who we trust to walk with us on the other side of whatever comes up, no matter what, right? If I'm going to ask someone to give me feedback, it's got to be someone I'm going to trust who will walk with me through whatever I've messed up and it will help me make it better. And also, we can only have so many Nathans, right? I told my wife when we got married, you tell me anything I'm messing up, you tell me. And she did exactly what I asked her to. And after about six months, I looked at her and said, Olivia, I will work on one thing at a time for you. And I promise I will work on one thing at a time for you for the rest of our lives together, but I can only do one thing at a time. <sighs> right? And ain't that the truth? We can only take so much feedback. Who is your Nathan? Right? Who is your Nathan? Who is the person who will tell you what you need to hear? Who will cut through the rationalizations? Who will help you see the truth of a situation? Who have you told, tell me when I'm messing up? Who have you authorized to be your Nathan? Also, if you are Nathan to someone else, please be gentle. Please. There's a fellow named Frank Clark who said, uh, criticism like rain should be gentle enough to nourish a person's growth without destroying their roots. Right? Criticism, like rain, needs to be gentle enough to nourish a person's growth without destroying their roots. When we tell someone they've messed up, people rarely see that coming. Right? It takes patience and gentleness to help people see what they don't already see. There are two implications of this that we need to chew on today. First, you ever get angry at someone and you're getting prepared to, to just to chew on them and you have it all in your mind and you're ready just to go in and right you, you got it all planned out the question is can they hear you and what does it take for them to hear you they've got to know that you love them and I'm not talking like just feel good about them like this is something I have to ask myself 
Before I go and I tell someone they've messed up, I have to ask myself, do they know that I love them because I have done something for them on a regular basis such that they just know I'm going to walk with them through this? There have been multiple times where I thought, I can't say this because that person doesn't know that I love them yet. And so what's the answer? The person who I'm angry with, I don't need to yell at. What I need to do is serve them until they know that I love them. And then, and only then, can they hear me. David didn't listen to this to anyone. David listened to Nathan, who had been with him all along. we got to love on each other like Nathan loves on David before we can hear each other. Second, do you know anyone who just simply doesn't listen? You know, that person, they do something unfortunate, and they're suffering for it, and it's everyone else's fault, and they never seem to learn, and they're always in trouble. You, got any, you know anyone like that? <laughs> there are always consequences. Always. David's family life falls apart because, as a consequence of his action. That God says, that, God, that Nathan says, God has put away your sin, does not mean that there are not scars from it. David has broken another family and it breaks his family as a consequence. To say that God has put away your sin does not mean there aren't consequences. What it means is that we are still in a relationship and we'll work, work through it together. Because that is the gift of, of, of critique, right? When we critique or we help someone see their rationalizations or we help someone understand a, a lie or, or we help someone with a problem, it is not just enough to point out there's a problem, there's also a commitment and I will walk with you through it. Right? That is the gift that Nathan brings to David. It's not just there's a problem, but I'm going to walk with you through it as we respond to the problem. And so if a person is not willing to listen, if a person is continuously blaming others, if a person does not see that there is something that needs to be in themselves that need to be responded to, then they have to bear the consequences of their actions until they are willing to listen. Right? And so the best we can do when someone will not listen is we can keep the door open and let them know you're always welcome here. Not cut them off and make sure that when they do hit rock, rock bottom that we're willing to, to be there with and for them. Right? The gift of the church is that as people gathered in the name of Jesus, we are committed to accepting and loving people as Jesus did. If someone came to Jesus, he welcomed them. People walked away from Jesus, but Jesus never walked away from them, and that is still true. We accept people here no matter what the scars, no matter what the history, whether those scars are small or large, visible or invisible, and the worst scars really are the invisible ones, aren't they? We accept people here. All people are welcome. This is the place where we dare to tell the truth. This is the place where we can find a Nathan to help us understand, and we can practice being gentle and love each other so that we can be Nathan to each other. This is the one place we dare to be less than perfect, because this is the one place we strive to, be perfectly, to perfectly love each other as Christ did. Thanks be to God. Amen.